And welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us as we um, introduce another guest on FSU Coach Live. And, and I'm delighted to interview uh, Kez McCorvey. Kez, uh, rather than me try to tell everybody who you are, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and kind of your, your progress as a, through your career, both as a player, coach, and so on, and where you are today? Uh, yes, I sure will. Uh, good, good, good. I guess it's good afternoon now. <laughs> Depends where you are, right? Exactly. And so I hope everybody that is listening to this right here is having a great day. I know it's tough, but uh, I hope we're having a great day. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, right now, currently, I'm, uh, I'm married. I've been married for 25 years. I have a wife. Her name is Loris, uh, beautiful wife, Loris. And then I have uh, four children. Uh, Imani, who's my oldest, is 25. I'm a 22 year old son, Kez Jr. And then a 16 year old son, Micah. And then my youngest is Christian, and two dogs. So <laughs> that's where I'm at now. I I'm originally from a little small town uh, in Mississippi. Uh, it's a suburb of Pascagoula, Gaucher. And I played football at, uh, at, at, at Pascagoula High School. At the time, it was the biggest high school in Mississippi. And we had some very good uh, athletes in that area, uh, football, all different sports, basketball, baseball, just a whole bunch of different, it's a very uh, talent rich uh, sports culture area uh, that I came from. And so uh, uh, I had a couple of other athletes that came before me and went to college. Shane Matthews was a quarterback at, at, uh, at the University of Florida. Uh, he was my quarterback in high school when we won the state championship. And then uh, Terrell Buckley, who came to Florida State the year before I did, uh, was I was also on the team. I'm sure everybody uh, has heard of him. He's been a uh, he's been he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. All that kind of good stuff I, I can say about Terrell. And then I followed him up here to Florida State uh, to play football as well and go to school. And it was a great experience. Got here and in 1990, got red shirted and and then uh, was on a uh, on on some teams that uh, you know accumulatively we went uh, 45 and four 45 oh, wow. four. yeah oh. so had a lot of success. <laughs> well, and and you were you were pretty successful too during that period. Let's be honest. Yeah, it was. I you know what honestly I did. I you know I, it's funny. This is the funny thing right about it. When you when you come from high school to college, you usually don't have an upswing in your production. In high school, I probably, in my career, I probably had maybe 400 yards of just receiving mm. in my career in high school. But so in what college, did you play in high school? I played receiver. I played receiver. And, <laughs> and you I, only had 400 yards. I had 400 yards in high school my whole career, probably. Probably maybe a little bit more than that, but not much. I mean, I had about 400 yards. But when I got to college at Florida State, my production obviously shot up a lot. I had about 3,000 yards. Of receiving in college, and so you don't usually go from 400 yards to 300. You usually go from 300,000 yards to 400 yards. But mine went the opposite way. I, I got to Florida State, and and really I got in the right place. I got here in the time, you know, and my skill sets were valuable here. I was very quick up. I was very quick. I was a six foot one slot receiver basically, and you know you didn't you don't really usually have tall slot receivers. They're usually short, quick guys, and I was a tall. Hollow, big, long arm, quick guy. And so it just gave me an advantage. And so we went to the no huddle shotgun offense, which which now kind of hit my my stride. You know, Charlie Ward was my quarterback two years. And I had a good quarterback before that, Casey Weldon, Brad Johnson. But Charlie Ward was my quarterback as we tr transitioned to a different type of offense. I went to the slot, became a slot receiver. And and, and then it, it, the, the offense kind of centered around a lot around me, around me getting open, the passing offense did. And so I went from catching maybe a couple of balls to catching all the balls, really, a lot of the balls, really, in that offense. And a lot of the stuff was built around me. And so it was a blessing. It was a blessing. It was good to be in that position. Got a chance to be All-American uh, here. And then, you know, then left and got drafted to the, the Detroit Lions. Uh, but what's up? What, what, was that ex what was that experience like getting getting drafted? You know what? It was it was really like a you know it was kind of like a dream come true. Really, that was kinda, when you were in high school. I you know I, I recall watching the San Francisco 49ers on TV and telling myself, you know what, I'm going to be a professional football player. Mm. So I, that's, I, I just I just recall that in my mind, saying that out loud. I'm going to be a professional football player. You know, and making that declaration in high school, and to finally get the point to where you achieve that goal, it was like it was kind of like. 
you know, surreal. I remember my one of my first, not the exact first game, but one of my first games playing. You know, I'm in Detroit. I'm young. I look across the field. We're playing the San Francisco 49ers. I look across the field and I see all the guys. And San Francisco, San Francisco was my team back then. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in the, in the Gulf Coast, and New Orleans was the team that we had to watch. You were kind of regional. And so the New Orleans didn't throw the ball a whole lot. They ran the ball and played great defense. So I, it was for me, it was like, ugh. And so the only time you can watch the ball being thrown around was when San Francisco came to town. And so when San Francisco came to town, I mean, it was great. I loved it. You know, you would watch that. They would throw the ball around, and Jerry Rice was catching balls, and Steve Young and – and Joe Montana was throwing the ball, and I loved it. And so when I got the chance to play one of our first games, we were playing against the San Francisco 49ers, and I'm looking across the field, and I see number 80, Jerry Rice, across the field. And I see Steve Young, and I see all the guys that I had grown up with, and now I'm competing with these guys, all right? And it's just like, wow. you know. And then my locker mate, the person that's locker was right next to mine, was Barry Sanders. For four years, four years, Barry Sanders, I would go – and I would, on Mondays, we would get our checks. And so I would go, I would pick up my check, and it'd be like, you know, kind of a little, a little bit. But then I'll pick up Barry's check, and it would be so heavy. <laughs> it would be so heavy. Like, oh, oh my goodness, Barry. My <laughs> so, did, you, did you feel any, you, you know, obviously you're, you're a bit awestruck, right, coming into the yeah. NFL and, and, you know, just did, did you feel any pressure to, to perform above what you – maybe thought you could because you're next to superstars or you, you know, you're playing against somebody on the opposite team who's, you know, playing lights out. And so you feel you have to as well. Was there the pressure there? No, you know what? Not really. You know, I honestly, I mean, coming from a program that goes 45 and four and mm -hmm. one, win a national championship, you, you are used to the spotlight. You used to the game being on you. And I was the same way when I got to Detroit, I really expected to come in and be a cog in the in why Detroit was going to win. I really did. I just had that expectation. I mean, I came from high school. In high school, we won the state championship. I had a bunch of good football players on my team. We hardly ever lost a game. I go to college, and guess what? You go and you win a bunch of games. You had a great a bunch of great teammates and great coaches. You win a bunch of games. You win the national championship. You go to the pros, and then you go to Detroit. <laughs> and so – you know, we went bad. We were good my first year. We were the, you know, the top offense in the league. But we went ten and six. Then we went six and ten. Then we went ten and six. And then we went six and ten. And so it was a, uh, it was kind of different than what I was accustomed to. Why do you why do you think that happened? I mean, it's so unusual to have kind of a a good winning season and then a bad losing season and then flip it again. That's that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is unusual. It's, it's unusual to, uh, to not have the consistency that that you would like. And I think in Detroit, that's where we were. We were just kind of right in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And so and so, what happens is, you know, when you have an expectation of, of being in the middle of the road, that's usually what you get. And it's a variance of that. You might win a game that you're not supposed to win or you might lose a game that you're supposed to win on the road. And we usually won most of the, the home games and we, we lost a lot of the away games. So is it kind of a, a maybe a, a culture, I, I say this carefully, a culture of mediocrity? It just kind of this is who we are? Yeah, I think I think I think that that's a little bit of that. And pro football is kind of different too as well because you know you you have you have different allegiances. Let me say that. You have different allegiances. What do you and, mean? Well in, in, in pro football, some of the, the allegiance that you have that's your main allegiance is yourself. Mm. Yeah. And so yourself you have to you have to worry about the your the, the main business, and so you have different businesses, uh, sex businesses within the context of a program. Right, and that's the dynamics of pro football. Is how do you get these all these different businesses to work together for one main goal when you have a bunch of different businesses in there? That's the mentality of it. Interesting. So you you played for Detroit Lions for how many seasons? I played there for like three, and then I was in camp in the third season. Okay. I was in camp, and then uh, – What do you mean by – you mean by camp not on the starting roster? Well, no, in camp that I got – my third year in Detroit, I got I got an injury, almost really just a, a kind of a, a, a career-ending injury. I tore a ligament in my foot, and then the that third year, and then the fourth year, I never healed, and so I came to camp, and 
I just, you know, my body just couldn't do it. Mm. And so they, 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 uh, they, they uh, decided to move on to another direction. And, and, and it was, it was probably best for me too, as well. And so I, I transitioned and took a year off and then NFL Europe and uh, for a year and then went to Carolina to the, to the Panthers to their training camp and uh, kind of made this circle. I, you know, I was in Carolina and the best thing about being in Carolina, Carolina was that uh, they were able to kind of decipher what was wrong with my foot mm. and sent me to a, a foot specialist and he kind of gave me the insight on my foot and had, came home and had surgery. And then I, I finished up my career playing in Canada, played two years in Canada and uh, first year, had a great year, led the league in touchdowns. And then my second year, I, uh, my second year, I, I, I think the third or sixth game, I tore my ACL. Oh. And then just decided, you know what, I mean, that's enough. It's enough. You know, it's time, it's time for me to transition on to the rest of my life, really. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to go back to Detroit Lions, okay? Mm-hmm. And – you know, you, you talked about having to, to go to training camp and, and kind of that t- talk me through kind of the experience of what it's like to, kind of, you know, be cut, be, be kind of, uh, we've talked about this in person, but, yeah. but just that experience of just, you know, you're, you're supposed to be this big superstar and, and then you kind of, you haven't really achieved maybe what you wanted to achieve and what certainly the fans want to want you to achieve. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with that? Because that's gotta hurt. Yeah, you know what? It it did. It did. It it hurt a lot. I I and, I, and for me, it had. I had a God used that, and I'm gonna talk. You know, about mm-hmm. God because that's what I believe. Uh, God used that to change me. Period. Because up up until that point, I I just couldn't. You couldn't tell me that I couldn't make the wind blow. I mean, every place mm-hmm. I've been, I I, I I I excelled and just you know worked hard. And if I worked hard enough, I could change the outcome of the circumstances, the situation that I was in. You know, I won a state championship uh, and what part of the team that won a state championship and, and was successful in high school. I was a part of a program that won a college championship and was successful in college. And there's no reason I could be successful in, in the pros. That's, I mean, you couldn't tell me that. But then, you know, you, you run up against something that, you know, is not allowing you to do the things that you've done in the past, an injury. And so when I got injured, when I got injured, uh, I struggled really bad. I really mm-hmm. did. I struggled really bad as well because because you know I was used to being the guy that people were afraid of. Mm-hmm. You know, they would see me in the one on one lines and they would say, "Okay, kid's number three. Let me scoot back to number four. <laughs> and I like that. But sure. when, I injured, when I got injured, nobody did that anymore. When I got injured. They were. It was like, okay, let's get it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that was one of the things. But then you know, for me, still, even in that when I was injured. I was still in my mind thinking, okay, okay, you can get me now. But when I get back, when I get back, I'm going to show you. But then well, this is what happened one game. This that kind of turned my thought process around. We were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I'm still on the roster, but I'm injured. And so I can't really do anything. Mm-hmm. And so the general manager calls me in the office and says, hey, kids, uh, we need a special team spot. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, now why are you telling me? <laughs> <laughs> Are you telling me, you know, and he says, well, uh, we need the, we need the, we need your space. We need your spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut you over the weekend. All right. And if you pass through waivers and nobody picks you up, we're going to bring you back right first thing Monday, first thing Monday, we're bringing you back. And I didn't hear any of that, that stuff about bringing you back. All I heard was cut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all I heard was cut. And, and you can just, I mean, if you'd have poked me a tear to pull out my skin, cause I was, I was just, I was crying on the inside because mm-hmm. it, that had never been, that had never happened to me where I just not been chosen or been cut, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, wow, this is possible. It's possible for someone not to want me on their team. Oh, I just didn't think it was possible not to, and, but it happened. And, but after, and, and I was torn. I mean, I was broken apart because an area in my life that I thought couldn't happen, happened. Mm-hmm. But Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. So, so you, you you got cut, and you know you went to Europe for a year, and then you went to Canada. Did did it feel like you were, um, to some extent, a, a, a failure because you had to you know quote unquote step down to a, a lower league, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, and I I did I really I, and I really did too. I, I felt like because 
I was I was in a situation where I was I felt like I was an elite player. Mm-hmm. When I was in, before I got injured, I was the starting receiver. You know, you go from being a starter receiver on the Detroit Lions, you know, coming to coming to my third season, I'm the starting number three receiver and I'm getting ready to be the starting two. My mm-hmm. receiver coach is, is lobbying the coach, hey, coach, you need to make kids, you know, the starter over there. All right. And then I get injured. And so all the things that I hope for that are right at my t- at my tip of my fingers, it dissipates. It goes away. And then I get the NFL Europe. I, I leave from Detroit and get the NFL Europe. And, you know, hey, I'm, I'm the best player that I ever played. That's what I know from one of this guy. Hey, ever being in the NFL Europe, I, I know that. I know I'm better than most of the guys. But still, I'm injured, and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm-hmm. And then I get to Carolina, and I feel like I should I should make this team easily, and I can definitely help this team right here. But I'm still injured, and, and you know, and you just, you're just in a limited capacity. Of, and, and then when I get to, I get to – Canada, my first year, I finally, I got, I finally have surgery that clears up a lot of the the issues, and I get to Canada, and I have a breakout season. I have 15 touchdowns. I could have, I could have scored 20,000 touchdowns. But really, I feel like it. I, could, I mean, I really could, and I scored 15 touchdowns, and 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 trying to prepare myself to kind of go back to the NFL, and you know, I found out that you know the contracts in the CFL are different the way you just can't leave, and uh, and so that's my second one of my second year I get injured and it's like you know but what happened is this right the first time I got cut it let me know that you know what maybe maybe I could be okay without football mm-hmm. maybe, I, maybe, I don't, maybe I don't you know you know maybe I don't need football football is not who I am that really that's really what helped me transition when I got cut it kind of opened my eyes. And then, you know, really there was a transition point in my life to where, you know what, you know, I had a spiritual awakening. I won't say it like that, but I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior shortly after I got cut. <laughs> and so it really kind of opened my eyes and freed me from that uh, thought process of that being, you know, your identity, my identity. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's, you know, there's there's also, you know, some some silver lining to some extent about going to Canada and that you were very successful there and and won great cups. And so it's not like, a, you know, Kez was great in college, went to the NFL, didn't do so great. The end. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's kind of a story of you kind of went through some some hard times and came out the other side and and, and you were successful. So yeah. it's, it's kind of neat to, to see that it can be done. And, and a lot of players, you know, when they experience the hard times like you did, it's easy to just fall away at that point. Yeah, I, it, it, it is. It is. And, uh, and I was, I feel like I was blessed to get in a situation, especially when I was, as a player to play in Canada, to be able to have an opportunity to show what I could do. I recall maybe a, maybe a couple of, maybe a couple of years ago, I read. I, I was reading one of the papers there, one of these short papers, and they had in there they had the biggest bus uh, of of the Detroit Lions, the biggest draft bus of the Detroit Lions. And guess whose name was in there? Mine. I'm like, <laughs> does it still bother you? I mean, does it still hurt? You know what? No, not really. You know what? It it it, it does. It doesn't. Not it. Not really. Uh, I tell you the thing that is. Um, that I take from my playing days that are, are, are the most valuable things that I have. Mm. It's not public per- perception, but really my teammates, mm. my teammates. And, and I, I, I uh, that is one of the things I value is, you know, my, the perception of my teammates. Was he a hard worker? Mm. Did, he, did he give all he, he could? Mm. And that's for me, that's, that's for me the things that I value the most. Now, what other people think sometimes is, you know, it's, it's not always accurate. And, and you know how that works. So you, you, you know, tear your ACL, you kind of decide that's, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Um, how did you, how did you get into coaching? Well, I, uh, it's funny. I was, I recall uh, uh, flying home on the plane. So I'm leaving Edmonton, coming down, coming back to, to the United States and going, coming back to Florida. It's, it's funny that the date and timing of it. So September the uh, 10th, Mm-hmm. Like 2001, September 10, 2001. All right, we're flying back from Edmonton. Our flight gets uh, delayed, and so I don't know. We don't know what's going on, but our flight gets delayed, and so we're stuck in Minnesota. 
All right, so we're, in, we're, we're at the Mall of America in Minnesota over there, hanging out on September the 10th. September the 11th, they got they get us a new flight, and we're flying on September the 11th, coming home. And so the same day that the, the Twin Towers fell, I'm getting in the house, pack, unpacking it, and I'm looking at TV, and I'm thinking, what is this movie that's on every channel? Wow. It's not a movie. <laughs> and so we get home that exact same day. A couple of days, I'm thinking maybe a couple of days later, I'm in church. And a friend of mine, you know, is looking at me right in the eye of the whole church service. I'm like, man, pay attention to the pastor. But he, but he's looking at me right in the church service. And so he comes over to me after church, after the service, and he says, "Kaz, guess what we're doing? We're we're training athletes." And so he convinces me to start with him a a, a training facility uh, and company here in town. And so we start a company called Titus Sports Academy here in town. And so the next thing I know. And I'm because I, I recall being on the plane doing this right here. I have been playing so long and I, I recall praying and saying, God, I've been coaching so long. What, what am I supposed to do now? I've just retired from football, made the commitment to retire from football. What am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do now? And it just so happened that he opened that door for me to start uh, 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 coaching, basically, but doing private, private practice coaching. One of the best things I've done. You 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 did that for for several years, right? And yeah. And and then we have this transition in your career where you're you're staying in sports, but but now you're moving into more administration. Tell us a little bit about kind of what you do now and kind of why you decided to do this. Okay. Yes, I will. So I I, I was in for eight years. I was in Titus Sports Academy. Then I transitioned to coaching, where I became a head coach. Now, <laughs> this is what you this is what you learn. Just just because you know a lot about one thing, don't mean you know uh, coaching. <laughs> so I learned that at McClay, that you know that just because you know you learn one thing, you know that doesn't mean you know all the stuff that it, that there is. I've been around coaching forever, but I didn't realize how much it, it is involved in the whole process of coaching, not just being an expert at one position position or offensive side of the ball. There's a whole bunch of other things that are involved as well. And so I, I did that and coached in, uh, in a small college in Tennessee and then coached in the CFL and then back to the United States and then back to the CFL and then back to the United States as, as well. And then now I, I, I actually I, I transitioned from uh, coaching to, uh, to to ministry. I, right now, I I work for a Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I'm the uh, multi area director for North Florida, uh, and it's been awesome. I I, I just recall uh, the process of me kind of uh, transitioning from coaching to uh, FCA, and when I think about it, it's really a lot of the same things. I'm using a lot of the same skill sets that I used in coaching, and I use them a lot in FCA. I really do. It's the same uh, uh, same motivation. You have goals that you're trying to set. It's really, it's really the same. What, what, do you, what are your roles and responsibilities within this title? What do you actually do in, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, if I can, if I can relate it to coach, okay, coaching. I am basically the head coach. Okay, I'm, I'm basically the head coach of uh, of of this team that we would call North Florida. And so basically, I got we got different positions and places and things that we want to to do here. And so my job is really to I, I hire staff. I work with our community, and, and and as far as you know, having people that want to have FCA in our community, I work with our staff as far as developing our staff and. and and painting the vision for where we want to go and helping them develop as far as becoming better staff members and FCA, um, you know, representatives and, 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 and ambassadors and all the other jobs that we have, trying to help them and then helping them to raise the finances to be able to be on staff too as well. So I'm involved in a in more, more or less of a head coach position where I'm coaching the coaches to coach. So I don't. I, I get a chance to to be involved in ministry as far as directly ministering, but that's on a little little scale right here. My main job is to actually help our coaches and minister to our coaches. I mean, minister to our our representatives and our SGA people to help them to go out and minister to our to our community in our schools and to our coaches in the area, and then help the people that want to be connected to the FCA ministry help them to be involved and connected to the ministry. So my job is more. Uh, I would say more like a general manager coach, a uh, head coach position to be able to help it 
go find a place for our guys to play. We want we got we got great teams right here. Find a place and a lead to the, for those guys to play. I want to go back to to what you were doing as a coach. You you told me that that you know you coached in the CFL a couple of times. You coached it in, in college. Um, I think in there you mentioned high school as well. Yes. Uh, what was that like for for you and your family having to you know kind of move 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 you know and and I think it's one of those things that that isn't really talked about too much is you know we always look at the coach but we don't look at the team behind the coach which is yeah. the family and and talk a little bit about you know kind of the the challenges associated with that and how do you negotiate those Yeah I can say this right here I think I think you know one of the biggest disappointments I have is the amount of of uh, moving that we did and the transition and that I took my family through uh, in the process of coaching and all those jobs. I mean, we, I mean, we moved a lot and my wife and my kids sacrificed a lot to chase after the opportunity to coach. You know, uh, we we moved from a place that we enjoyed in Tallahassee the first time I moved as far as the business is concerned with Titus, which I consider coaching too as well. We moved back to become a head coach here in town at a local school here in town. Then we moved again. And when we moved to Tennessee, I moved up there by myself. They stayed here. They traveled during the weekend back and forth for 12 hours. All right. 12 hours to come see me at school for those. Uh, and I was there for about six months. And But they came up there 12 hours and I stayed in a dorm room. So the dorm room I stayed in was about a quarter of the size of my garage here. <laughs> and I stayed in the dorm room there and they came to stay in the dorm room with me uh, during those weekends when we had the games. And then I lived, then I got coached in Canada. I coached in Toronto. And so Toronto was a long way from Florida. And so my wife and kids, they lived in Miami and I was staying in Toronto for half the year. So, so the benefit of that is, you know, can, Canadian football is you, you work half the year. So half the year I'm working, Really half the year, I'm at home uh, 24-7 at home. Uh, but those times when we were away from each other were, were very tough. You know, they were very tough to be in a situation where you were away from your family for an extended period of time. Uh, as Because my kids were in school and they were going to school at, at the time and then I'm coaching away. And so, uh, and then the same thing as we transitioned from there, left them, Canada and being away from each other, we came back and we were in high school together and we were locally in South Florida and I was coaching in South Florida and then I left and went back to Canada again and kind of the same process again. You know, my wife and kids are down in South Florida and I'm in Canada and so they would come during the summertime and stay with me uh, half the, for, for, for a couple of months and then we spent probably three months away from each other um, as, as we were ending up the season. In the so... Future. Is based on those experiences, you know, did, did you find any things that, that helped like ease the, the challenge or the struggle? You know, well, I, I think, I think every coach does this right here. You kind of look to the future. Okay. Hey, it's not going to be like this in the future. Okay. This is a stepping stone. This is the open door. We're, we're getting into a better situation. No, I don't think any coach takes a job like that with the anticipation of staying there, you know, staying in the situation where you stand in the dorm. So that's probably a right now situation, but it's not the situation that you ultimately want to be in. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot harder to, to kind of persuade a spouse about that, though, when they're in the immediacy of, you know, living away from you and, and with kids and things. Um, I'm assuming there was a lot of communication and, and things going on. Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of time we'd be spent on the phone and spent on FaceTime. And mm -hmm. FaceTime was uh, our best friend, you know, get a chance to see everybody's face and the kids and, and, and communicate and, and every break by break, every break I had, I was trying to get home and, and spend time with my family too as well. And so that was uh those, those that was hard, a hard decision. Hard decision. And you know, if you ask me now, kids, would you make that decision again? I'd probably say no. Mm -hmm. Well, if you if you do have any questions for for Kez while we're on, now is your opportunity. Just put it in the chat box and and, and we can ask him all kinds of things. Um, one of the things that I, I really, really want to ask you, Kez, is, is you know, from your perspective as, as both a player and, and then as a coach and also in your role now, looking at, at people who are interested in becoming coaches or, or working in, in the sports world, you know, 
what, what kind of advice, what kind of recommendations would you give them that would help them be more successful? Um, yeah. Not just short term, but, but long term health as well. Yeah, I, I think um, I think everything has to have a starting point. And when I say starting point, I mean, you got to have a uh, the motivation behind why you're doing it. And if you don't have the right motivation, you're going to open yourself up for many perils and hurts that are involved in the coaching uh, experience. So uh, can, I, can I kind of pinpoint what do you mean by right motivation? Well, I mean this right here. I mean, if you if you have the, if you have your motivation that you want to be the, the be considered the greatest coach of all times, mm-hmm. if you have the motivation of trying to make a gazillion dollars, uh, make a you know make you know Nick saving money. If you have the motivation of you know what you want to be, you know all those different motivations that are that are probably not uh, considered uh, right motivations. All right. Those will probably they'll lead you to a place to where you'll probably be uh, very dissatisfied with the results that you're getting. Okay, because uh, they will. Because you probably you probably more than likely won't make Nick saving money. <laughs> you probably won't get a chance to. You know, most guys don't get a chance to 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 coach on the national championship team. You probably don't always get a chance to do that because it's not always up to you. You know, mm-hmm. it's not always up to you to get in a situation where you can get in that position. It's not always up to you. And so it's, it's, it's a situation of, you know what, what's my motivation? Am I motivated to just, do I love coaching? Do I love the people I, I get a chance to serve? Am I, do I have a servant heart right here? Would I do this if, it, if I was doing it for free? If I, you know, it's, it's, it's going so at some point in time, it's going to challenge you enough to say, you know what, man, why am I doing this? All right, I'm not getting paid. All right, I'm living, I'm living in a dorm. <laughs> my family's, uh, a thousand miles away. All right. Why am I doing this right here? And it's going to challenge you to be able to have written. And, and, and if you don't have your motivation, if you don't have the reason why you're doing it in line, it makes complete sense right here. And you're not committed to going through the whole process. You won't make it. You won't make it. You'll find a reason not to do it. Mm. So, so definitely kind of look at what your values are. Yeah. In terms of what, why you're choosing it? Is it is it selfish or is it selfless to some extent? Right, giving giving back and by giving back you gain something in return. Um, okay, so um, anything else you'd like to add? You know what? I I I think I think um, uh, one of the I want so I want to talk about that same thing. One of the greatest things I heard. I, I was at a coaches conference once and I heard Bobby Bowden uh, speak. I heard him speak, and I heard him a million times. I played for him. I heard him a million times, but I'd never heard him speak as a coach to me as a coach. Mm. And he spoke about uh, he spoke about he was speaking about how he became the coach that he was. You know, Coach Bowden, he really wanted to be the head coach at Alabama. All right, he really wanted to be the head coach at Alabama. And early in his career, they were, Alabama was not going to offer him the job. He just hadn't accomplished enough, but. I think after he had won his second or first at the end, you know, and been to like his 27th straight bowl game or something like that, some crazy numbers like that, where he's, you know, Alabama finally offers him the job. But he thought to himself, okay, why would I leave Florida State here where we're already the best team in the whole country? We go to national championships every week and go to Alabama. And what he realized that the place where he, he, he wanted to be at Alabama, but Florida State had become Alabama. It had become the place where he wanted to be. All the things that he wanted in an Alabama-type school, he already had here at Florida State. And he had developed that just from being faithful at where he, where he, where he was. And so I think, a, I think a big part of just any coaches right here is when you're looking for opportunity, and I'll say this right here, is, is be excellent where you are. Be excellent where you are. A great coach is a great coach all the time. Mm. A great coach is a great coach in any circumstance and situation right there. And I think the best thing a coach can do is this right here. So work on yourself. Don't, don't I mean, you can work on strategies and all that kind of stuff like that, but you got to be a person of great character to where regardless, who, regardless of what situation you're in, you're consistently excellent. In there. You, you work a lot with, with coaches and, and you go in and talk to, to young athletes in high schools and, and so on around North Florida. And you've obviously traveled the country and world in, in the sports realm. 
what do you see as being a, a real challenge for for those in the sports world today what that that you know, you kind of look and say, this is, this is an area where we need to provide education and training for maybe athletes, but also for coaches to, to ensure that they're successful and are doing things safely and ethically and, and with the right philosophy. Yeah. And I, I would say this right here. I say one of the most important things is this right here is that, uh, is that coaches and athletes know why they are there. I think sometimes we, we think that sports is the end end all. It's the mm. is the is the is the result. Is what is is why we're doing. It. Sports is sports is not sports. Is it's a it's just a conduit. It's a conduit for I, 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 if I can use this word a blessing. It's mm. a conduit of how God blesses uh, people. It's not necessarily the end thing. And I think sometimes we we get to the point where we just think that it is sports is the thing that's going to make me happy. Being the head coach is going to make me happy. Being the star athlete is going to make me happy. Being a, getting a scholarship is going to make the thing that's going to make me uh, happy and, and the most successful and get me the most fulfillment in my life. And in reality, it's not. In reality, you know what, and from my perspective, this is only one thing that that brings fulfillment. And and for me, that's Christ. And so for athletes, I think I think you got to really think about okay, what are the things that gonna that gonna give you the most punch and impact in your life? You got to really ponder on that as a coach right there, and not have sports and athlete, you know, being in the in the limelight be that uh, be that thing. Yeah, so you, you would you would certainly think that maybe there's too much of an emphasis on winning as opposed to character development and some of these other things absolutely and because i think this the, the end goal is what is to, you want to win right but mm -hmm. the, you ever heard this story you can't if you look at the scoreboard you can't it's hard to win when you look at the scoreboard is i read a book that is a guy that writes right wrote a book he was talking about lead and lag measures and you have a a, a lead measure is a measure that you do that uh, it affects the lag measures. The lag measure is the thing at the end that you want. Okay, we want to we want to win the game. But guess what? If you just look at the scoreboard and want to win the game, that doesn't make you win the game. But if you if you do what if you uh, take care of the ball, that's a lead measure. That if you take care of the ball, guess what? We'll keep the ball more, which will keep gives opportunity to win. All right, because we'll score more points. That's a lead measure. And so I think I think I think you really have to focus on the things. That matter most, okay. And I think some people take the process on the product. Exactly. Some people take that for granted. They are so focused on the strategies and this technique and that technique. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit less technique and more of you know what motivation. All right. It's more. It's a little bit less strategy and more of you know what uh, of having the the right attitude and, and and personalities on the team and having the right structure on your team and having the right uh, system. As far as the way you conduct practice, how you talk to your players, how you love one of your players, all the kind of stuff, you got to have the right stuff like that in place to be able to to really put you in a situation where you can maximize what you do have. Some people got great talent, but they don't; they just can't get they can't get they can't get guys to show up for practice. Well, those are all the questions I have. We do have one question, and uh, if you want to ask more, feel free before we we kind of finish the the interview, but. Um, here's one from Dr. Jason Williams. He's a, a faculty member at FSU, and uh, he says, can you talk about the culture of the FSU teams in the early 90s? Did the coaches define the culture or did the players? The program became this iconic brand of fast, aggressive play with a unique swagger. Miami had it. Michigan basketball had it. It's rare. Did that evolve from the players or coaches? But it, that thing came from coaches. Uh, it did. It really did. And it it's funny too. Is is because you know you got some some unique personalities, and you those guys were behind the scenes, so you never noticed them uh, any of them. But you had some unique personalities, and their pers their personalities kind of rubbed off on all the players. Like uh, Coach Bowden. First of all, I talk about the head. Coach Bowden's personality. That joker there. He he never he never. Now, he's never out of a out of out of a situation. He always sees the bright side of the thing. He, he I mean, he does. He has an infectious uh, uh, ability to always see the bright part of it. Okay, he just does. He always. I mean, you can't tell him that you don't have a chance. That's just not in his vocabulary. That you don't have. A, we don't have a chance. No, that's not his vocabulary. He's gonna always see an opportunity or a chance for you to win a game. 
I just never been in that situation. And I think that rubbed off on us as well, too. And then you got guys like Mickey Andrews. My goodness. I mean, just the intensity that he brings to the every day. I recall one day we were in uh, summertime, and it was just, it was like it was summer camp for, for little kids, about a Bowden football camp. And we we had done mat drills, and he is very demanding on what he wants in mat drills. Finish through the line, okay? Don't give up. Have the right technique. Be low, you know. And, but I, I recall this one kid, and he was a young kid. He was he was in Coach Andrews' line, and I saw him out of the corner of my eye. I saw him not finish through the line. And I said, okay, this kid doesn't know it, but he's in trouble. <laughs> so I went over there to try to save him before he did it again. Coach Andrews called him. But as I was going over there, I saw Coach Andrews see him not run to the line. And I said, oh, too late. And Coach <laughs> Andrews, I mean, he just let him have it. And you think it's a, it's a camp. The kid paid his 300 and whatever dollars to come to camp. Man, let him just do what he wants to do. Coach Andrews doesn't do that. He said, this kid here paid his good money to come to camp and be coached, all right? And he wasn't going to disappoint him by not giving him his best. Mm. <clears throat> Those are the personalities that I, I was around, and I loved it. I loved it. The, the, the expectations of that group of guys. And I had, I mean, Coach Van Hallinger, and I love Coach Van Hallinger. The expectation, first time in my first time that I had to where he, man, a man said, I love you. He did. He would constantly say, kids, I love you. Hmm, coach, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but thank you. But that was the attitude and personality of the coaches there. It was great. It was a great culture. It was a culture of accountability. Everybody was accountable. You had a standard that you had to up, the up, up stand, up, uphold. All right. You had a, both in the class, both on the field, both in the locker room. All right. You had a standard that you had, and, and it, it, it was so embedded to where the coaches didn't have to coach it anymore. The players would coach it. You know, when I when I became a senior, guess what I would do? I, I made sure that those freshmen held the standard. This is the standard, buddy. All right. This is the standard of how it's done over here. We don't we don't we don't do this. We don't do this. We do this right here. We do this right here. We always do this. And it was just ingrained in us. Well, there you, you have it. Uh, a lot of great information, a lot of great stories. Um, Kez, thanks so much for, for joining me. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I wish, obviously, we could have done this in person, but, but given the situation, yeah. this, is, this is better than nothing. So yeah. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share. And if anybody wants to, to get in touch with you and, and maybe ask more questions or find a little bit more about F, FCA, how, how would they do that? Well, they, they can go to our website. So we have our website is NorthFloridaFCA.org. NorthFloridaFCA.org. You can look on uh, the website. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. Any of those other ways, guys, you can you can contact us, okay? So uh, definitely get in contact, contact with, with us uh, at NorthFloridaFCA.org. Well, Tim, you are good. That was, that was fast. That was yeah, fast. Was, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thanks to everybody who's watching, and, and I hope you um, you do get in touch with Kez, and, and I, I really do appreciate um, you taking the time to, to talk with us today. All right. Thank you. Thanks.